So welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is July 24th, 2013, and we are about to talk about C CL MOOC um, and, um, and all the good things about CL MOOC. And I've been um, actually... Karen Fastenpower has been with us here in New York City, I can say, and she's over there in my dining room. Um, so <laughs> it's great to have you here, Karen. Um, but Karen um, talks about CL MOOC like, um, like it's the amazing thing. Um, so we want to find out much more about that. Um, and we're going to find out what's the difference between a CL MOOC and a MOOC, and what is a MOOC, and what is CL, and those are some of my questions to kind of kick off some of the questions. But I, th but we've titled the show, and I think the week you're in is is about envisioning future or the future. Um, so that's kind of what we want. Well, that is what we want to talk about. So thank you for using TTT to help us help you think about all of that. Um, we should uh, do introductions very briefly, and if it's okay, if everyone go around and introduce themselves and say about you know, Karen wondered if we should identify who's uh, writing project here and who's not. That would be useful to do, and then. Um, just because she wants to make an announcement there. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the, um, and, um, so do that, and then say how you're connected to CL MOOC, and then say anything else you'd like to, to say. Um, can we start with Allie? Yeah, sure. Right. Um, so uh, my name's Allie Passwire, and um, I'm not part of the writing project. I'm <laughs> just a CL MOOC participant. Um, and I am, uh, I've been a preschool teacher for 10 years, and I'm going to be an elementary school teacher for the first time this fall, and I'm in Bellingham, Washington. Cool. What, what grade, what elementary grade? Um, it's actually a really small independent school, and it's mm -hmm. K through 5, and we're all one big happy group. So, so it'll be a really interesting experiment to teach 5 to 10 year olds all together. We shall see. <laughs> nice. Welcome. Can you tell me, uh, to, and this will get us started a little bit, um, how did you get, find CL MOOC? Um, embarrassingly enough, I can't remember the name of the other MOOC that ended up pointing me in the direction of the Connected Learning MOOC. It was through MIT, and it was huge. Mm -hmm. It was enormous. And I kept getting emails, and it was so big that it got split into all these little groups, and I ended up in a group where no one participated. So um, I can't remember the name of it, but... Um, what, what was that, Karen? It was... Learning Creative it, Learning. Yes, Learning Creative Learning. Which I was also in, and I also ended up in a group that was not active. Yeah. But I loved the course. Yeah, I ended up in a really uh, quiet group. So, um, And then they sent out an email about this MOOC. So I thought I'd give it a try, and it ended up being a much better fit. So... Okay. Thank you for coming to me. Christina. Great. That's a, it's great to hear that, Allie, um, because um, so I'm Christina Cantrell, and I work for the National Writing Project. Um, and uh, I always say it's my great honor to work for the National Writing Project, and I really think it is. And the MOOC just example, you know, sort of shows again why it is, because it was just a really interesting opportunity to work with a set of teachers to think through what a MOOC could be for the summer that was related to connected learning. So that's what I've been doing. That's my um, that's been my way of participating. I've been the staff supporting this sort of team to come together and think this through. Um, and Ali, I was with um, Philip Schmidt when he sent out that email um, from Learning Creative Learning to announce the MOOC. And it was so wonderful just how, you know, that community, we had a ton of sign-ups that day because of that email. And it was just really nice to see these communities working in concert like that together. So that was really nice, and um, I'm glad that this has been a good fit, and it's been wonderful to learn from you throughout this whole thing, too. So thank you. Somebody should keep track of metaphors, I think. Um, mm. I, but I love the working in concert. That's an interesting mm. one to start with. Fred, welcome. I'm Fred Mendlin. I'm associate director with the Central California Writing Project based at UCSC. 
in Santa Cruz, and we actually serve three counties in our area, so it's a very large um, territory. And uh, I was alerted to the MOOC from the very early connected learning ambassador work that we did from uh, the, the uh, last annual meeting where there were rumors about something like this coming. <laughs> and then I followed it along. And one of the things that's been most exciting for me about it is not even realizing until about halfway through that actually the NWP people had officially changed what the C stands for in MOOC. It's usually used to refer to class, and NWP changed it to collaboration. And I'd been thinking of it as that from the very beginning, and so when I found out, oh, yeah, that was actually the intention, that was even more exciting, and uh, I've also been helping to organize and run a face-to-face -face group here in our local area in conjunction with uh, the MOOC and a study that's going on about um, using face-to-face -face groups with a MOOC environment. So that's also been very interesting. So great. A lot of stuff to go back there. Thank you. Karen. Cool. I'm Karen Fassenpower, and I am now finally proud to be able to announce that I'm officially somehow affiliated with Writing Project. I just finished um, Borderlands Writing Project Summer Institute and really excited to be a part of that group. And I'm, um, I'm here in New York working with Youth Voices, which I am a huge fan of along with many other Writing Project projects. And I'm a co-facilitator I say I'm, I'm the weak link in the facilitation <laughs> team of CL MOOC, um, and I feel like I've been identifying more as a participant than as a facilitator, but I think that, for me, that's a mark that this really is peer learning. Like, it's is peer learning really working? Because I feel sort of more participant than, than facilitator, but I've really, really enjoyed it, as Paul said, and I just feel I'm excited about talking about the future and sort of how we continue because I feel like there's lots to continue and just really a brilliant community that is just doing fabulous things together. And I am also um, coordinating the face-to-face -face, um, sort of uh, study project um, in conjunction with Peer-to-Peer -peer University. And so I'm anxious to hear from Fred and Mia both more about um, their experiences with what that dynamic has been. Because we think we think that's an interesting dynamic, and that's something Paul, I, Paul and I have even been talking about with Youth Voices, because it's primarily an online thing, but we're, we're working with a group of youth for several weeks face-to-face, -face, and just the potential to start something face-to-face, -face, face -face, but then move it online um, seems like a really strong sort of blended learning done right. I think sometimes blended learning doesn't always have the greatest connotations to people. I think there's places it can be great. So, happy to be here. Mia? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mia Zamora. I'm from the Kane University Writing Project. I'm the director of the Kane University Writing Project, which is in Union, New Jersey, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Kane University. I'm also an associate professor of English there. Um, I got involved with the MOOC um, immediately when Christina contacted me about the plans to um, launch this. So I was just very excited to see something specifically from the National Writing Project that would follow up on sort of this fervor around MOOCs, which uh, to me really um, sort of came to the foreground of the educational landscape last summertime. So, um, Admittedly, I dipped into a couple of MOOCs that were sort of meta. You know, it was like MOOCs about MOOCs. <laughs> um, I, 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 I sort of dipped my feet a little bit into the MOOC MOOC and also Et MOOC, which was more about educational technologies. Um, but I knew that the National Writing Project's effort to do something on a grand scale like this would emphasize that collaboration. And Fred, thank you for letting me know that the C was transformed into collaboration, because I didn't know that, but it's absolutely in keeping with the National Writing Project's ethos. Um, and I think absolutely it was successful in that sense. Um, it was truly collective and collaborative and connected learning that was happening, at least for me and um, and the group that I've been involved with 
in um, my local space. So, um, as Karen mentioned, I was um, bringing together a group locally. I was part of the F2F face-to-face -face, uh, groups, um, directing one of those. So I'll be happy to speak about that um, as well. But I think that element, as well as the broader connected um, aspect of what we did together throughout this MOOC um, was successful. Monica, welcome. You popped in just alphabetically correctly here. So. <laughs> well, so, uh, Mo Monica, you're somebody who has changed words many times yourself. So, <laughs> change letters, especially in the conversation. So, welcome. <laughs> thank you. But what did you want to say? I interrupted you. Are you doing introductions? Yes. I, I just want to share, I guess, as, as I was listening there. It reminded me of a very poignant moment in my life. Um, it was my first time to listen to even to know what a podcast was. And it was Howard Rheingold and Alec Kuros and Dean Shersky. And the focus of their conversation was what's the purpose of being together in a space. And so that's what keeps me coming back here to listen to all of these minds talk about that. So I'm looking forward to tonight. Very cool. Um, and thank you. Uh, I, I'm Paul Allison with the New York City Writing Project. And um, I'm not so familiar with MOOCs, i got to say. So um, I'm uh, going to listen and learn with you all here tonight. Um, the one piece I want to add from this summer is that uh, some of the young people on youth in, in our Youth Voices Summer Program have been on Hangouts like this. So they are already face-to-face -face on computers. So instead of calling face uh, like physical meetings, we now call that knee-to-knee. -knee. Um, so yeah. <laughs> that's uh, one, little, one little addition that I wanted to add here. Anyway, Sherry, go ahead. All right. I'm Sherry Edwards. I teach middle school language arts in a very rural area in Washington State, so Cooley Dam, Washington, so just across the street from... Alley, I think. Yeah, just um, a, a good five-hour street, but yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I joined the CL MOOC from the ET MOOC, which was huge, and um, I wanted to be part of a connected learning community and to see what other teachers are doing and wanting to do in their classrooms. And it was just an amazing, right away, you know, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to get involved with everything, but from right up front, there were enough facilitators welcoming everybody in a way that said, do what you can. You know, look, listen, lurk, do whatever you can and participate when you can. You have to drop out and come back in. And I think that put so many people at ease that they could just come in and do what they could. And everybody... With, there were enough facilitators that I think everybody was able to get encouragement and that made people participate even more than they probably thought they would. So I just want to thank everybody. It was a very well thought out and well presented MOOC. Nice. And yay, Karen got to be part of the Writers Project, which I'm not part of, <laughs> except to follow Sherry, along. Sherry, why don't you start one? Come on. I might. <laughs> <laughs> Good <Great>. idea. <laughs> Terry, welcome. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm Terry Elliott, and I am uh, a tech liaison with the Western Kentucky University Writing Project, and I went through my writing project about 13 years ago, and uh, I am a serial MOOC lurker and non-completer and failure. And I don't mind admitting it. Yay! yay. <laughs> yay I need to have a little solidarity here from people around me. Um, but I'm a facilitator on this one, so hey, I'm going to finish this one. It's great. <laughs> and I got started with um, the whole process last August during... Um, Connected Educator Month, which I don't know if the uh, Department of Education was, it was just kind of a window dressing sort of thing, but it quickly turned into a uh, very deep 
dive for me and through that whole month, and I got to meet uh, Karen and a lot of the people I have eventually worked with um, on the on CL MOOC. So um, it's it's been a wonderful ride, um, and it'll be like almost a year since I started this ride, and it looks like it's going to keep on going with things like the Educator Innovator Project, and um, I'm just really excited. Uh, about how this MOOC is very so very different and so very personable. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, thanks thanks for having me tonight, Paul. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, uh, lots of places we could go here. Well, one of the things I want to check, though, is is it true that a MOOC is something that ends? Let's can we start with that question? <laughs> well, we're going to see. That if I'm not, <laughs> we're going to see. <laughs> No, but, but, but so, Ed, it's, and attached to that question is a lot of you talked about moving from one MOOC to another MOOC. So is that sort of uh, what this culture is about, or is that... So, I think one so of what, the... Yeah. I was just going to say, I think one of the hallmarks of the MOOC has been from the beginning um, that you can determine your level of participation. And the dropout rate in MOOCs is dramatic. Um, I think it's something that the, the official s statistic is something like 25 or 30 percent of the original participants are still involved at the end. Um, maybe it's even less than that. I think it's um, six. I think it's six percent. Maybe. Oh, so, okay, something, yeah. something much like it, it's it's ridiculous how few hang in there, so to speak. Um, which but, which, by the way, is higher than people who actually participate on Wikipedia, for example. But <laughs> but go ahead, yeah. What, what is that, what, 3%? Yeah. Is so, it 3? It's lower. Yeah. One thing anyway. that I, I think that was very brilliant about the way the writing project uh, or, or um, the CL MOOC um, sort of unfolded was the emphasis on that in and of itself from the beginning so that people felt sort of... Um, unencumbered by the fact that they might not be able to make it a, for a couple of cycles or they didn't feel guilty basically um, and they I think at least that was my own experience um, there was sort of a, a, an upfront um, this is how it usually works and that's okay and I, rem I in my own invitations to the face-to-face -face meetings you know the the attendance was very spotty in that one week some people would come, the next week other people would come, then there'd be a week that was thin, then the next week everybody showed up. You know, it was sort of um, erratic in that regard. But every time I sent a note out, I would say, um, if you've never been, don't be shy. Even if you've only went on the MOOC one time to check it out just to sort of familiarize yourself w with what it's about, you can still come to our conversation. That kind of emphasis really, I think, helped people feel okay and really spurned a lot of collaboration. Anybody want to add to that? I, I agree with Mia's sort of, I mean, I appreciate that that's how the MOOC seemed because that's certainly what we were aiming for. And I think as I've thought about, sort of before CL MOOC, as I've thought about this dropout question about MOOCs, I, I'm not sure that that's, like, it depends on the MOOC, but I'm not sure that that's the metric that really makes sense for MOOCs because mm -hmm. if it's sort of self-directed, intentionally drop in, drop out learning, I, what does it mean to drop out? And so we sort of looked at this and said, you know, we want people to be able to dip their toes in or participate in different ways, and I'm glad that it seems like it, it is that. Um, and then just in regard to your in initial question, Paul, I'm thinking a lot about the sort of intersection between MOOCs and community. And I think MOOCs, in terms of being a course, it's the start and end thing and it goes away. Um, but I think there are a couple MOOCs who've really fostered an ongoing community. And it's interesting that some of them don't care to be referred to as MOOCs. And I think that has to do with what MOOCs have become that people don't like. But they're really more of a community. And so I think we're, st we're sort of starting to look at, you know, 
what what's the community around CL MOOC and what where do people want to go with it? And that's really what we're exploring in this make cycle. Well, it's in interesting to think about the difference between the collaboration term and the term community, because I, I think that the, much as I love the term collaboration and love that the CL MOOC was a collaboration and not a course, I think actually what was the most valuable about it for me was the community rather than the collaboration. That is, there wasn't a lot of collaboration in the way we usually think of that word. That is, you have a single project, you have a, a bunch of people that are all committed to that one project where there's a product and you're, mm -hmm. rather it was people doing sort of individual projects and explorations bouncing off each other, uh, remixing each other's. Mm -hmm. it, that's much more community activity than collaborative activity. Mm -hmm. And that was what was so wonderful about it. It just felt like, hey, it's OK to play around with this stuff. And you're, you're going to get um, almost all positive feedback. And if anybody is, is saying something that that seems in any way critical, it's because it's something that's really important to them, and they, they need to speak up about it. You know, it was very, very much, and I think could be ongoing, a, a, a community. Mm -hmm. um, for this resource that Jennifer Wolven um, from uh, Central Texas Writing Project did in Digital Is, I'm not sure if it's live yet. But she started also playing with this idea. She wasn't in the MOOC, but she was doing leading the Connected Learning study group that we had in the, the spring, which was a bit more like formalized, as it were, less, less open, um, although open in many ways, too. But anyway, this idea of like collaboration versus community is something that she was really playing with in her classroom, um, Fred. And, what was interesting is she brought it to this idea of shared purpose, actually, mm -hmm. that she was thinking that shared purpose in terms of connected learning was more about collaboration, but then she realized shared purpose was actually, um, in this example she has from her classroom, is sort of like a everybody's working on stuff, and then you intersect and help each other at points where it's helpful, and then you keep going. It, it was very, it was different than collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll try to post that into the um, chat if it's there, but I think it's an interesting distinction. And another thing to add to that is I think that we are moving now <clears throat> towards more of this collaboration in its normal sense of the word, uh, shared purpose in small groups. And uh, um, I think that's, you know, I, th I think it's really wonderful. Karen described this in one of the newsletters as the, as the Janus effect, I think. It's yeah. Janus looking back. Credit to Stephanie. Okay. <laughs> and so we're looking back. We had just finished a reflective uh, a cycle. And now we're looking forward towards where this is going to go and who are we going to do this with. <clears throat> so uh, the next couple of weeks are going to be... I think uh, a little bit, Fred, it might have a little bit more of that collaborative element to it. But Terry, Terry, could I just uh, hear some clarity on that, though? Because I, I think you just meshed the difference, right? Is that what you did? <laughs> I mean, you between said... Commu you, between I, community I think and collaboration. you just said collaboration was shared purpose in small groups, right? Right. Well, Whereas yeah. I think what Christina was saying, that that's community. So I just want to clarify terms a little bit. Did I hear um, that right? <laughs> I think the shared purpose, for example, in the, in the MOOC, in CL MOOC, um, we had these things, we called them makes, and then we had these make cycles, okay? And in a way, that was our shared purpose. Right. We, were, we all agreed that we would make something, and it might be a toy hack, or it might be a map, or it might be an introduction. but. Uh, like Fred said, it was a lot of individuals working on that and then getting more ideas from other folks. Mm -hmm. And and that's the way it's been, I think, throughout. Um, and now I think we're 
moving more towards people gathering together to work on a project together, uh, so smaller group projects. So, where, whereas before it was a, a uh, kind of a structure built in, it was built into the structure. Okay, the community was built was cooked into the structure. Mm -hmm. and now we're working out from that to these small groups, and we've you know we've we've uh, our facilitators I think are starting to work uh, think about projects with the Make Bank, for example. Um, and using that in, um, I think there are three or four of us right now who are talking about using that in our um, um, composition courses this fall. Uh, so I didn't make it any clearer, Paul, but <laughs> uh, I mean, I think we are collaborating in a large sense up to this point. And now I think the notion of collaborating is collaboration is shifting towards. Or what are we going to do with this, and who are we going to do it with in the fall? And um, I don't know a lot about the Educator Innovator um, project, and there's going to be more about that a little bit later this, this next week, I think. But uh, next half hour, too. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. cool, cool. But I think we're that's where we're moving towards. Yeah. Can I suggest that that like the, just to take the toy hack as an example? That there was collaboration around the toy hack, right? People remixed and, and looked at each other's and played with each other's and stuff. But that wasn't what the community was about. It wasn't about toys and hacking toys, right? So I, I just wonder if there was collaboration around like doing things, but the community was about was about other bigger themes. Is that a fair way to think about things? We can we can get off this if it's too abstract, but <laughs> I think it's a big point. I mean, to me, collaboration is about sort of working together on fairly discrete projects, like the toy hack or the credos or whatever. And and community is something much bigger. I mean, community is about people and certainly shared interests. But I think you can't. It, it, it's you can architect collaboration, but I don't think you can architect community. I mean, I think it's something that comes together around people, and part of it is just people caring about each other and reaching out to people and talking, and I, I think I saw that in CL MOOC, and I, 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 an example of how I saw that happening is we talked about things that didn't even always have to do with making or connected learning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about, we got into a whole big food thing, and a, a group of people talked about fitness, and we shared a wedding. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on. And I think there's some intangible to community that has to do with just human relationships. And I also feel like community is more ongoing. I think collaboration is something you can kind of come together and do and then walk away and community has a different feel and that's sort of back to that question of you know does a MOOC end and I would say probably a, most MOOCs end but communities keep going I, I love what you oh, go ahead okay well I was just gonna say that the collaboration I think was more in the feedback end to help give people ideas. So like for instance in the toy hack, I just I couldn't understand the some of the toy hacks that were going on. It just wasn't what was happening in my house. But um, <clears throat> then people would say, well what about a card game? Or, you know, what about music? Or, you know, and so then that totally opened it up when people started offering suggestions when they could see that people were stuck. So the collaboration was in ideas and process more so I think than than products yeah. and I thought that was very very important and very encouraging because as soon as a facilitator sent something they jumped right in and said you know encouraged with something else or another participant I mean it was very much as Karen said she felt as much as a, a participant as a facilitator, and so there, it was, there was a great equalizing there, which is what we really want to get to in our classrooms. 
because we're not experts anymore. Yeah, I, I think that's true, Sherry. And I was just saying in the chat with Anna, I think it's not the it, like what brought me in was the to the MOOC was the idea that we could I could learn some new tools for making, you know, to maybe share with students later. And that was kind of the whole reason I joined the MOOC, but that was just the medium for other conversations. So, you know, talking about, um, you know, what it means to make learning connected or what it means to uh, remix someone else's things or what it means to introduce kids to coding. I think it was, that was our medium, not our goal. So, and that's what makes it a little bit different than the other, at least the other MOOC that I attempted to participate in. Um, is that the we had something to do physically? You know, it wasn't about go read this, or um, it was about doing something kind of fun and getting immediate feedback from facilitators who just felt like participants. You didn't feel like someone was just sticking in a comment and said, "Hey, good job. We're glad that you whatever I did. I took apart a baby book and made it into a mask. You know, like whatever. It, no one said, "Hey, good job." you were encouraged to use other tools to share your toy hack. So stop motion animation to show what you made or a vine to show what you made or uh, using Thimble to kind of make a list of all the places people could find your makes. So it was just, it was just a, a way to kind of get warmed up because then at some point we kind of stopped the, not the kind of like, it was pretty lighthearted I think at the start and then we were able to get a bit deeper because we had already collaborated together and remixed each other's work. So I think it was just that context. Mm -hmm. And that seemed really unique to me. I, I wanted to go back to one thing that Karen said. I, I loved what she said in general, but the one, one comment about you can't really architect community, I, I, I think you can, actually. And I think that's one of the reasons why the MOOC worked so well, because it comes out of the writing project, out of writing project people who have been working together under shared ethics and values about how to work together. Yeah. I, I think immediately of one of the principles we use in our, in our ISI and in many workshops of assume positive intent. Fred, ISI is? The, uh, the Intent, uh, Intensive Institute. Summer Institute. That's the, that's the gatekeeper for becoming a... a so uh, it's a four-week institute sometime or right. sometimes less, but okay, go ahead. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Very, it's very intimate. You get very deep with each other, and the, the, one of the norms that we agree on at the beginning is assume positive intent, meaning when you start to feel a reaction to something, like, oh, somebody's criticizing you, I'm feeling put down, I, that's too sensitive, that's too, you, you try to rethink, well, what would be the positive intent that person would have had for making that comment? Is there some way I can reevaluate it so that I, I honor them having a, a, a positive motive for that? And there, you know, the other one I think of is the bless, press, and address um, for, from the uh, I anthology, from the E anthology, about setting guidelines for how you want feedback from people. And um, we didn't actually do that formally in the MOOC, but the atmosphere that that many of the key people were writing project people who had that sensitivity and sensibility. I think really helped to architect a, a, a caring, respectful community. Mm -hmm. Well, could, could I shift us to, as, as I've been hearing about um, turning a children's story into a mask and, and other kind of specifics, I'd love to hear from some of the specifics. And, and in particular, I, th I think some, something about the make bags would be worth describing. Um, and my question about that was, was that planned ahead of time? Or did that just come up? Or So you want to address some of those questions? Terry, you want to talk about Terry. that? Yeah, I think Terry should. 
Well, part of our um, our model, uh, what we looked at, we thought was just a, a really fantastic MOOC was um, uh, Jim Groom's uh, DS106, his digital storytelling class. And in that, he has this incredible um, set of, what do they call them, dailies or daily assignments. I can't remember what they're called off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, in his class, it's a it's a face-to-face -face class, but anybody else can join in as well. And so there are these daily things that you can do. And you can also add to so that, you know, somebody wants to contribute and wanna, wants to, to make something, uh, then they can. It's everything from um, pictures to animated GIFs to, I mean, just all kinds of things. So that was kind of our model. And the idea was that we really wanted people to, we didn't want it just to be us saying, make this stuff. We wanted people to be also be able to say, look, I made this, or I want to make this, and I can share this with you. And if you want to make it, you can make it too. So, you know, instead of the, the, uh, the hierarchy from the top down, it's from the bottom up, from the folk. And I think um, that Karen and I really felt strongly about how important this was to the values that we felt the MOOC, CL MOOC should represent. So the Make Bank is is a, an expression of that bottom-up creativity that should be part of the equity that, that that's part of connected learning, its values. And I think Karen did most of the, well, I know Karen did most of the work of actually making that happen, and it was not, <laughs> it was not a trivial matter uh, mm -hmm. at all. And um, so, it's we did invest in it, you know. It, it was a value that we invested in, and I'm glad we did. And Karen, Karen has been responsible for taking to making sure all the makes get put into place. And I know all the facilitators have encouraged people to put that in the make bag. That make a great make bank item. Uh, and I don't know how many we're up to already, but I think we've, we've talked about possibly moving the, some of the attributes of the make bank over to digital is. Um, I, I just really think it has a tremendous potential. So what's it look like and how is it different than digital is or a website? Is that... Karen, did you do the programming on it or creating well, it? Or it's not it exactly borrowed from or programming, but... Well, whatever. <laughs> yeah. it, I mean... It, Really, all credit to DS106 for the idea for this, and it's basically sort of participant-generated activities and content. Um, and so, the what we wanted to do in CL MOOC is sort of have a theme for the Make projects, but really not um, not to say like here's the Make you should do, but like make your own Make, and just it we. We wanted to do a real, a kind of a simple web-based thing where people could put in their ideas for a make, and it would go into a database. So it mm -hmm. was done with Gravity Forms feeding into WordPress, but it's it's pretty simple. And we've um, we've documented the process. I think it's it's something that I weirdly enough I had another project that had the exact same need, so I was able to sort of work on them in parallel. But I think for a while I've been looking for an easy way to do. Um, a front end, a web based front end to a database that kind of automatically happens without having to do a lot of, you know, reposting or MySQL or whatever. And, you know, for this, Gravity Forms seemed a really good solution. I'm a big fan of WordPress, it's, you know, integrated right into that. Um, and I think there are a million applications for this. Anything that you want to have sort of a database approach to, but you want users to come up with the ideas. And I think that's just a marvelous uh, way to think about learning. Like, here's our, here's our big objective. You go, you go figure out how you're going to learn this. And then share it with other people, remix. I wanted to just um, credit Paul um, here, too, actually. Because, um, so Paul Allison here. <laughs> 
um, was one of the advisors for the MOOC. So we, um, so the whole facilitation team um, had experiences maybe in MOOCs, but just in online teaching um, in other ways too, and learned from MOOCs. But then we also had people that we actually asked for input into how to run this thing. And so, Paul, I mean, your your notions about really making, like, rem remembering that this is summer <laughs> and that, you know, like, really thinking about what you've learned from Youth Voices about being interest-driven and what educators' interests might be in summer would be really very diverse and, you know, like, or anybody's interest in the summer and would be a really... Uh, wonderful time to embrace that. So I would say that that ethos that I think really comes from Youth Voices too um, help to inform um, the ethos that you see in Connected Learning MOOC and um, I think is what you know Terry and Kevin really brought, uh, I mean Karen brought to the design work that they did too. So that's a possible future, is that right? Working with that design, working with the Make Bank in some way. Does somebody want to speak to that more specifically? Is there any ideas for? Well, Paul, I've told I told Karen that and a couple other folks that one of the things I want to work on is uh, is developing a WordPress theme that incorporates as many of these elements as possible, so that perhaps uh, writing projects can combine a G plus community and WordPress blog in a way that makes community a little bit easier to do, although I would love to have more open source tools than, than G plus community, even though they tell us they're not evil. I have my doubts. Um, but, uh, you know, that's something I'd like to do, and I'm not a WordPress, I don't know how to write a WordPress theme or anything like that, but I figure if I put it out there and people we can join together, we can figure out a way to make it work. Just like, you know, we joined together for the CL MOOC to figure out a way to make the gravity forms work with WordPress. It's, you know, and we we had we were able to access enough uh, technical uh, uh, skill from other folks as well to make it happen. So that's that's one future possibility. Go ahead. I, I, I do. I do. I do. I feel a need to make sure we get some co some commentary, some some descriptions of the face to face work that was done as well. Um, if, if we could shift to that before we go into more future things, um, and, and that's Fred and Mia. Is that right? Um, there was face to face work. Mia, you described it a little bit, but do you want to describe more? Um, sure. Um, one of the things that was really timely about the MOOC was that uh, our, the Ken University Writing Project's ISI, that's the Invitational Summer Institute, um, happened to be happening at the same time as the CL MOOC. So we actually used the MOOC as a kind of supplementary aspect of the um, Summer Institute experience for the teacher consultants involved with us for the summer. So that inherently gave us a smaller group that would meet face to face each week and in essence I had our I invited all I sent out an invitation to all those who I thought would be interested in expanding their knowledge of digital tools um, our general Kane University writing project e-list which includes educators pre-service teachers all kinds of different um, people coming at education from a variety of different places I sent out an invitation to faculty at the university as well as the writing projects community. Um, and the list was very long, as you could imagine. But when it came down to it, I would say that around 30 people were a part of our face-to-face -face group, but not the same 30 showed up for each week. Sometimes it was mostly the um, Summer Institute folks other times, it was it was faculty members on campus who were excited about that particular cycle of making 
Sometimes it just happened to be who was on campus that week because they had meetings, et cetera, and we're just, it, we met at the Starbucks on our campus, so it was convenient in that sense, too. Yeah, I was going to yeah. ask, I was going to mm -hmm. ask what the space was. So yeah. was, you just we, said a Starbucks on campus. But, we met, yeah. we meet at Starbucks, and um, actually the last meeting is tomorrow. Um, but we meet at Starbucks, and there's a big table in the back that we sort of, colonize, take over, and move chairs around, and, and you know, people bring their lunch, get their drinks, there's sort of mini conversations, and I'm attempting um, to also lead us through some of the observations that, um, you know, we come by week to week. It's been a really dynamic experience, and sharing has always been the, the sort of ethos and, and vibe that's occurred there. Um, so it's been great. You know, we, a lot of us have our laptops and are just really proud of what we created and just turn our laptops around to show our friends what we were able to make, that kind of thing. Um, but we've theorized, too. We've talked about, you know, some of, um, you know, what I think was really effective about um, this MOOC was that there was a make cycle and a sort of call to create, but on the tail end of that was always a reflective aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, stop and think about what this has meant to you. So there was a call to theorize what you just experienced in cyclical um, steps. And uh, of course there were six of those, you know, six revolutions of that experience basically. So if you weren't j able to jump in at one point, then you could jump in at another point. But I think that aspect of reflection was just as important as the creating um, in terms of really coming to understand what connecting connected learning can be and what it might mean for educators going forwards, etc. So that just gives you a little bit of a sense of what we did in our face-to-face -face. and as I said, our last meeting is tomorrow and um, you know, it's, it's been great. And Fred, do you have something to add on that? Well, we, we had a face-to-face -face group that was kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum from that one the the group had a core of only three people besides me, and um, they were the, my colleagues from the Forge Project, Ed and Dan, and then Dan's wife, who uh, is a Spanish language teacher, and none of the three of them had really had any experience with MOOCs, with any kind of online learning or really anything interactive on the computer to speak of. They, they basically are all people who do email, surf the web, and that's it. And so just going through the face-to-face -face was crucial for getting the concept. It's a very, very hard to convey to somebody who doesn't have the experience what it even is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so being able to literally stand over people's shoulders and help them get the, do the clicks and get the setups and get involved was crucial. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, it also really helped to create a, a, a feeling of camaraderie and solidarity. And we did a lot of chatting and laughing about um, a lot of different things in the process of it. Um, so it, it, again, was a wonderful experience, but at a very different level um, from what you just described, Alec. So do you think <laughs> one of the questions that keeps bubbling up for me is, um, is why massive, right? I mean, what's wrong with small? So, so I wanted to kind of bring that up a little bit. and. Um, what you just described there, Fred, I hope it's massive so that it's reaching out to people who are not already, you know, MOOC geeks. <laughs> so, so do you think this MOOC did that, and how did it do that? So it's reaching out to teachers who might not be teachers and others, but certainly teachers who might not already be doing this kind of work online. Oh, I, I made a mistake. I, I thought it was massively open, Paul. Oh, not okay. just massive. <laughs> yeah, right. So <laughs> there's, there's nothing you can do. You can you can invite people. You can put the party out and it's a wedding canon, right? Mm -hmm. So, but still, you know, if you build it, will they come? I don't know. Uh, 
So it was massively open so that we could test that. So I think Field of Dreams actually works in this case. Say more. What do you mean? Well, you know, in the book um, and in the movie, uh, he gets a message saying, if you build it, they will come. And the whole month before, in preparation for this, you know, there were people every once in a while would say, well, what if only 10 people come? And we said, well, that's 10 more people than <laughs> we had before. Uh, and Or what if, what if we have 1,000 people participating regularly? And that would always cause us to pause, too. I mean, that is massively open. So I think it's, it, it's an open question, but uh, a good one is, you know, what are you trying? Are you just want numbers? I mean, you know, the, the, the ex MOOCs seem to want numbers, you know? Like uh, Sebastian Thrun's, well, I don't know, how many he not end up with? 150,000 people? started his course and maybe a thousand people finished it. Um, That's still pretty big. <laughs> they, said, they said it was more people than ever went through the face-to-face -face version of that same course on campus. Yeah, uh, history, in history. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's something. It is something. It is something. But I, you know, when I, I really did think it meant massively open as opposed to massively numbered. Mm. Which most, I'm not sure all MOOCs are massively open. No, they're definitely not. So, and do you think it's reached, that this one did reach out to teachers who might not been, have been involved in this kind of work before? And, and if it did, how did that happen? Or how might that happen more as we go on? I think so on a couple fronts. I mean, I think there were, um, it was an interesting mix of people. And when, when Fred was talking about the existing NWP community being foundational to this, I couldn't agree more. Um, but one of my sort of questions that I, I don't guess anybody knows the answer to, but of the however many people participated, which is even that is hard to get our, our handle on, but somewhere between a thousand and two thousand people like how many of those were writing project people we don't know and I think certainly having a core of that um, made all the difference in sort of launching this community but I think there were people in CL MOOC who didn't know writing project prior didn't know writing project and didn't know connected learning and some who didn't know making really I mean as a as a sort of you know educational pursuit and so that was new to them. And then I think there were some people who hadn't, uh, I think a lot of people who hadn't participated in a MOOC before. Definitely a lot of new technologies that all of us learned, including myself. So I think people came, because it was a multifaceted thing, people came without prior experience in different areas, but everybody got exposed to new things, mm -hmm. which is cool. Yeah, in my face-to-face -face group, um, all of those different constituencies were represented. Um, there were writing project um, TCs who were there, but who had never approached a MOOC before, or feel, uh, who who maybe weren't comfortable with digital tools at all. Um, there were faculty members from the university who knew about MOOCs, but didn't know anything about the writing project. Um, you know. So everything you just said, Karen, I can say that I know exact. I know at least one or several people that fit into those categories that you were outlining. So, <laughs> I, I think another question <laughs> that I'm hearing uh, somewhere in the air <laughs> is: Can can communities? <laughs> Continue without a lot of support. Now, so so, uh, by 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 that I mean people, you know, organizing those communities. I, and I and and to start this question off, I thought it'd be worth recognizing if you could tell us some of the others. I mean, Kevin Hodgins was very involved in this. Um, Paul O was. Chad Sansing. Who else? Um, Joe, Joe Dillon, Anna Smith, mm -hmm. Stephanie West Puckett. Okay. And then maybe it was the an awesome, but, yeah. amazing team. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and so I that, think. Go ahead. Yeah. So that team is really important. So how do you continue a community 
do you need a team to, con to make the community continue? I think that team is really important, but I think as community develops and really as peer learning takes off, the community takes on, you know, different people take on leadership roles. And we've seen that, I mean, I, I've never seen this happen so fast in an online space where in, you know, whatever, we're in our sixth week, we have people in the community who have as much of a leadership role as, as facilitators. And as much as, I, like I was saying, I feel like more of a participant than a facilitator, there's people who are, you know, I'm, they're sort of participants, but they seem more to me like facilitators. And I think when community works, do, you know, roles emerge from different places. But I do think it requires people, and I think people, there have to, there have to be some people, whether they're, you know, just like any community or any school, whether they're whether they're formal or informal, lead designated leaders or facilitators, there have to be people who are dedicated to be around and dedicated to the community. And I certainly, I mean, I feel that sort of level of commitment. Like I, you know, this is a community I would continue to hang with. <laughs> Because you think leaders would emerge or have emerged. I already. think leaders have emerged, but also I feel like I'm getting more from this community than I'm putting in, and that's what makes community work. I mean, I feel the same way about Twitter. I, I for many years, I thought Twitter was kind of a waste of time, and now I'm one of those people who say I, you know, t I, I couldn't get by without my Twitter community. It's who I turn to when I want to share something or when I want to ask something. And it sounds so weird to say that, but it's, you know, if I look at the amount of time I spend on it, and it's not just, it's not just, it's not a ton of time, but it's it's continual. You know, there's other communities, I drop in for a month and I'm, I'm intense there, but then six months go by and I'm not there. And, and I think, I mean, I think everybody has a limit on their time, but I think there's communities that you feel like, you can't not be a part of. I'm borrowing <laughs> Monica, <laughs> and I, you know, I think it's finding those places, and then, then it's easy to give back because you get more than you give. We're we're I'm fast out of time here, but Christina, could you talk a little bit about uh, the educate the innovative educators network, or is that what it's called? Educator or innovator. Okay. Say it again. Sorry. Educator Innovator Network. Yeah, I got it right. Good. Which you can find at blog.nwp.org slash educator innovator. So. so that originally that was the intention, right? That that somehow I mean I did hear you all saying this. <laughs> um, that that the MOOC would somehow spin out into these into these that's one place it might go. Is that right. fair to say? Well, I mean I think that the um, that Educator Innovator is meant to support educators uh, writ large, so inside and outside of schools, um, to uh, have a space and start to have a community to connect around connected learning. So I would say that CL MOOC in some ways is a manifestation of how some of those communities can start to look. You know, I, I think it was an experiment to see what would happen if we did something massively open, as Terry says, and um, and and uh, then I think the facilitators really took it into this place of you know let's put making first and let's think about connected learning through that that work. So I think that that what we're starting to see is that that's that's one way that a community connected to this larger educator innovator initiative can work. I think the educator, what we'd like for people to do is to connect with the Educator Innovator Network because um, what we, it's really a network of networks, Paul. So I think that like in, we've been using metaphors of, you know, the ripples in a pond or the concerts, you know, people working and playing in concert with each other. And I think Educator Innovator is meant to bring um, lots of different partners together who are thinking about connected learning and you know, help us sort of like find and feed each other and have those ripples connect and have us play in concert in different ways and sort of get a sense of what the larger ecosystem is um, thinking about connected learning. 
So um, right now, Educator Innovator is a blog, and I, I posted the blog onto the, the link, or I thought I did. Oh, yeah, I did. Um, and um, you can sign up for the blog, and you'll get um, blog posts and newsletters. Um, there is uh, work being done there you'll see around a fund. And um, this fund is um, meant to actually support educated innovators. And I would say that um, uh, two things about that is that um, I think in terms of a fund, there's this idea, you know, how like some things like ex sort of um, really radical invent invention and design, there are funding streams for those things. You know, they happen over here. But that like space where educators need to sort of innovate and tinker and play around and sometimes fail and maybe fail a lot <laughs> and have like small chunks of money to like try something out and um, and then sometimes really succeed and then move that into a larger project. Like that space needs needs a way to sort of to get some funding and support and so that's sort of what we're thinking about and um, the idea too would be to pull funds from a variety of places to fund um, across to be able to support people across not just like a funding stream for in school or a funding stream for out of school but a funding stream that starts to cross you know different institutions mm -hmm. so that's also part of um, the vision, you'll see that um, they do, uh, there's a description of that in 2013-2014. But right now, um, I think CL MOOC is a community within Educator Innovator, and I think we just want to tie that CL MOOC community to the Educator Innovator sort of ecosystem. And then if you look on the blog, you'll also see there are lots of partners, and all of them are doing work for educators that, that brings in principles and ideas around connected learning, so people can do those too. No, sorry to rush you on that, but that was a, a good, quick description. Um, I think this has been a really fascinating conversation, and, and a lot of people have contributed really nicely. But I, I also think it must feel a little incomplete. But I'm wondering if uh, CL MOOC is still happening, right? And this question of, of um, the future of CL MOOC is still happening on the, on the MOOC, is that correct? So could, you, could somebody kind of describe a little bit about where else you might continue this conversation about the futures? <laughs> that would be a good way for us to wrap up, I think. Who would like to take that on? Actually, I just wanted to um, share with everyone one um, my version of where I'm going to go in the future, and I'll be writing about it and blogging about it, so it'll be articulated more clearly in 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 written form. But um, I'm actually designing a winter session course through the university, which will be um, yeah, <laughs> which will be an exploration of connected learning inspired by this. Um, infrastructure and architecture that was designed here. Of course it will be sort of um, more focused for um, specifically for a smaller community, but it will also be um, synced with a huge MOOC. So it will be, sort, which is a Coursera MOOC run by Kathy Davison from Duke, um, who um, is uh, the director of Haystack um, humanities, arts, technology, and uh, a collaboratory. Um, she is running her first Co Coursera MOOC on the future and history of higher education. This will happen in January. So there'll be um, a multi institutional co located sub experiences. And the course that I'll be running through the Kane University Writing Project and the English department at Kane University. Um, will be one of those mini sort of satellites which would support one aspect of that broader discussion about um, higher ed and the future of higher education. Um, and so my intention is to invite all of our colleagues at the Kane University Writing Project back. Some of them are also master students in our writing studies program, so the course would be a part of their degree. Um, you know, or their degree progress as well. So this is an example of a kind of sinking and an inspir you know, a, a furthering 
of what was inspired over the course of the summer. And that's being designed now. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a, a very pragmatic example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a you know, very, very good example, I was going to say. Yeah. And I would invite people to continue this conversation on the CLMOOC G Plus community. You can go to G Plus and look for CLMOOC, or I pasted a link in the Etherpad in the chat, or on Twitter with the CLMOOC hashtag. Yeah. Lots of activity on both of those. And I got to say, one of the metaphors, by the way, that um, is a bank, right? You guys are rich. You have a bank. <laughs> <laughs> That's your anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so thank you, um, all, all of you, um, for continuing this conversation. Really glad that you were able to do it here on TTT. Um, this, uh, we're going to sign off uh, now and uh, give us all a little rest. Um, we are uh, we broadcast over the EdTech Talk uh, channel of the World Bridges Network, and we thank Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier. Uh, Mr. Mook, um, for um, for starting uh, some of all this off. Thank you all, and good Thank night. you. Thanks. Good night. Thanks, Thank Paul. Paul. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night, good night everybody.